Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlaub, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to Paris, France, to talk with Frederick Rupert. Freddie, as he is known to his friends, and he is my dear friend, is a French avocat à la cour. He is also a member of the California State Bar, a dual French US citizen, and an honorary member of the Hawaii State Bar Association's International Law Section. I've asked Freddie to share his unique personal and professional insights into life and current events in France, Europe, and the world. Aloha, Freddie. How are you? Hey, good. Bonjour, Marc. <laughs> oh, bonjour. Yes, aloha. Uh, aloha. <laughs> I, I want to start off, uh, you know, thank you for being my guest today. Uh, it's such a pleasure to, to see you. And I, I know uh, you're, you're in Paris right now. And I want to ask you a few questions. First, I want to talk a little bit about your personal uh, and professional background. And uh, I find it interesting. Uh, you are both a French avocat and a California attorney, as well as a dual citizen of right. France and the United States, and we can put up both flags. And my my questions are, I mean, how did that happen? And does it create a conflict in any way uh, in your life or your profession? And how do you balance your views of the world with being a dual citizen of France and the United States and a, a lawyer in both countries? How does that work? Please. Tell us a little bit uh, about your yeah. Well, I was uh, I was born and raised in France, um, and uh, at some point I moved to the U.S. because I had at the time married my uh, the the person who became my wife, and who was uh, born in San Francisco. So we decided to move to San Francisco because um, as a lot of uh, originally non-U.S. citizens, the U.S. have always had a special attraction to me in particular and to a lot of people of course so um one of my dreams was going to the u.s which i did uh thanks to my wife but um i was already a uh lawyer not a licensed attorney but a lawyer at the time because in france you can be a lawyer without being an attorney and uh, so i moved to the u.s and i realized that in the u.s you can really practice law only if you're a licensed attorney. So I looked into all that and um, I went through the motion. I passed the the so-called baby bar in California and then the big bar and I became an attorney um, quite some years ago now. Uh, so I was first an attorney in California before becoming a, a licensed attorney in France. I practiced for many years in San Francisco and at some point, we decided to move to France. And um, I, years after that, because I didn't do it right away, but years after moving back to France, I became a French attorney. So my uh, California license predates my French license by more than 12 years, actually. So, so I learned how to lawyer, um, how to practice law in the States, um and um uh, so it, it it that gives a special perspective on how to do things because the the practice of law is very different in the US and in France and um as a matter of fact when i came to france i i knew that no matter what i never wanted to do a litigation again <laughs> because what i what i did in the US probably i uh, left a bad taste in my mouth well, so I, I decided not to do that anymore. And on top of that, I was always attracted more to the business side of the law. So anything that touches to or that leans toward finance, corporate, um, M&A, investment, private equity, financing, that's, that's always been my preferred taste um, in terms of the law practice. So... I mean, obviously, naturally, I was more attracted to uh, the transactional work of the law and then the litigation side of it. 
So, so that's how I became a dual attorney, France and the U.S. But uh, I mean, really, originally a U.S. attorney. Ah, that's interesting. And and so you you were, were attracted to United States, then you were attracted back to France. And uh, you, you know, going back to my question, I mean, does and, and I guess the U.S. citizenship came with being an attorney in the United States. Uh, is there is there a I mean, do you have you ever have a conflict with you know uh, sometimes or, or or political or social events and and how do you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know the fact that you uh, you live in two different countries of through your life, you live through different countries. It gives you a lot of uh, perspective on two things. It, it, it helps you realize that things are not necessarily as bad as they look or as good as they look. And being far away from a place uh, gives you a lot of uh, relativeness, relativeness in terms of how you appreciate things or how you apprehend things, how you look at it, and how you digest the, the different events and how you spit it out, basically. Um, but it is true that sometimes I feel conflicted because I can see what's wrong in the States. I can see what's wrong in, in France. People often ask me, I, because especially when you're in the States, people ask me, I mean, how come you wanted to come to the States? Are you crazy? And when you talk to French people, it's exactly the same question, but the other way, right? It's like, what? You can live in the US? What are you doing in France? And, and the response is that there's no black and white response. I mean, there's good and bad in both places, and you can't, you cannot have a perfect place. I mean, there are some real good things in France, some real bad things in France. It's the same thing with the U.S. The U.S. is definitely not the best country in the world. There are a lot of things that would need to be rethought and really redesigned. But at the same time, there's some wonderful things in the U.S. that there's no way you can have in France. So... Actually, being able to straddle is a nice way of enjoying both good sides and try to avoid the pitfalls of both sides. So I, I like that. What you're saying is, you know, you know, going being in, in the different countries gives you a perspective that uh, you know, you know is very good because you you can see deeply into both countries, both sides, and and it allows you to. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, not be so one-sided <laughs> in a way, more. Yeah, more... yeah. it's not only being one-sided, but it's also having open eyes and an open mind mm -hmm. how things can be done differently. You know, I you like don't that. have to get stuck in your way or in, you, can, you don't have to get stuck in the, some ways because it's always, always been done that way. It's actually, it's, it's a, it's a, a narrow-minded way of view or way of seeing it, seeing things. You know, and, and I actually think that is a good thing for your clients uh, because you, you can see clear, you know, different perspectives and you're able to advise your clients uh, on the good and the bad in both countries. So I, I can see that and, and not just one-sided, yeah. Uh, that's really good. Yeah. I like that. that. That's true. And well, not only you can do that, but you can also, because you can see through the client's eyes why he reacts a certain way, you can somehow explain <laughs> why the other side is saying something, why they're thinking a certain way, and what you should do of it. Uh, you know, I being like a that. cultural <laughs> interface is more important than being uh, just a legal interface. Yep, that's, I, and that gives you the insight into what people are thinking by being a citizen. So that's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. It sounds like a, a good thing. Now, I wanna, I wanna move, move on a little bit. Um, uh, one, one thing, uh, I, I wanna put up a photo of you uh, you're an honorary member of the Hawaii State Bar Association's International Law Section. We have a photo of you in Dubai with the other members of the Hawaii delegation that were there for the Inter-Pacific Bar Association's 
uh, annual annual meeting uh, a short while ago. You're aware you're you're the only member wearing an Aloha shirt, and you're wearing an <laughs> Aloha shirt today. And I I know because I've I've seen you many times. You love Aloha shirts. How did I, and I, I, give me a brief reason why you are into Aloha shirts? Well, I've always liked um, Hawaiian anything. You know, I mean, part of the American dream. Is Hawaii right? And the Hawaiian hat uh, or Hawaii and the Hawaiian culture has a a very special taste in 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 that because actually it's it's exotic. It's uh, I, well on top of that, I love the sun, I love the sea, I love the heat. So it's part of that beach sun uh, and fun um, atmosphere, right? So the Aloha shirts are a major part of it. So I've, I've always liked Aloha shirts for the longest time. I've actually, I have a big collection. I've had to, um, <laughs> give some away because actually they were too big for me. I kind of like shrunk over the, over the years. Right. So I had to give some away, but I still have about 50 to 60 different colors of you know, and different styles, some for the night, some for the day, clear, light, different green, blue, red, whatever you can name it. So I, I really like the 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 relaxed feel that comes with it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're you're a natural member of our uh Hawaii uh delegation. Um I'm very I'm very, very proud. Actually being a member of the of the uh, international section of the Hawaiian bar is one of my uh proudest moments. <laughs> Well, good. Now, now I want to I want to delve a little into Europe and France, and I, let's put up a a map of France for a minute. Uh, and France is right right in the middle of of Europe, uh, and all sorts of things are going on. I want to first ask, you know, uh, President Emmanuel Macron ha has uh, had been the subject of some political unrest in France. Uh, he proposed uh, pension reforms, and there were right. thousands of French citizens taking to the streets in protest. And I, I, I mean, I was really surprised. Uh, what's that all about? And what's the status of that? What, what? I, I didn't quite understand why there was so much opposition to raising the country's retirement age from 62 to 64. But I mean, I, I don't have that same perspective as you, right? I, I, I'm not <laughs> French. Uh, well, French. Listen, but tell me, is, what's that about? This is um, this is something where my American perspective helps uh, because actually it is true that um, with the population aging and aging well, because actually um, now you can live old and, and in very good health for a long time. So it's not it's not insane to think that we can work longer in good health. Um, it is true that some people have had hard lives and 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 should not work longer or, or later in life but there are some special disposition in those uh, in in the law in the current law as well as the new laws that 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 uh, provide for that so when you look at it the way it was set up um the retirement age used to be older than 60 it was if i remember correctly it started at 65 but at the time the life expectancy was lower it was late 60s early 70s so you know when you had to work until 65 but you could expect to live until 70 that only left a few years in retirement now we can people my age for example we can the life expectancy right now is well in the 80s and being in good health i hope i'll go at least until 90 <laughs> so if I retire, even if I retire 65, that still leaves me like 25 years of retirement. And but and and the current retirement age is actually 60. So that gives me 30 years of retirement. So this is this is one thing that led to the reform. The other thing is that when the system was designed and put in place, there were m way more active people than retired people than now. Somehow the ratio has changed and there are less active people for retired people than they used to be before. So the financial burden is heavier on the working people because we don't, in France, you know, you have two systems of retirement. You have a system which is a reallocation system when the working people pay 
for the people who are retired, they finance their pension. And you have the capitalization system, which is pretty much what, ha- what it is in the US. When, when you work, you put money aside out of your paycheck to finance your future retirement pension. So those two systems, in France, it's a reallocation system. I so repartition. So, of course, it stands, it is sound if you have a lot of people working and few people not working. Mm. But if the ratio changes and you have less and less people working for more and more people retired, there's not enough of working people pool to finance the pension for the people who are retired. So because of all that, the system had to be reformed. So, so the, the, the people that were objecting were objecting because they would have to pay more over a period of time and couldn't retire and get the benefits of the state. Is that it? Well, the people who are objecting, actually, I think they, they don't necessarily want to look at the big picture. But what they want to look at is their vested right, because actually right now they would be able to retire 60 and they don't like the perspective of having to work for more years, which is at an individual level, it's understandable. But when you look at the big picture at the society level, somehow we have to take into account that we live longer in better health. And no matter how you look at it, the system had to be reformed because if oh, not, yeah. it, it would not it would not function properly from a, from a financial standpoint. So now the problem that Mac, Macron has had, I'm sorry. Is it going to be reformed? I mean, it's going ahead then. Okay. Actually, the law the law was uh, voted by the parliament and the senate, and the the the, uh, the decrees are actually being published right now. So the reform is in. It, 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 it it's bound to be to be uh, to come into law. It's actually into law right now since it's been voted by both chambers. But it is gonna it is gonna be implemented. It's gonna be the law. Okay. And and, and, and people are protesting because of what they see as an attack on their vested right to to retirement at age sixty. I see. And so it, it, has this affected Macron's popularity? Or Yes, it has. It's... But Macron has tried to, I mean, ever since his first term and into the second term as well, he's tried to reform things which are uh, traditionally very hard to reform, the retirement system being one of them. So the problem is not so much that he's trying to do something, but his style is somehow remote from the way that people feel about him, or he he's somehow a little too rigid or a little too uh, bold to really relate to the population. Mm. See, so his problem in terms of the opposition that he encountered with with regard to the pension reform is the the it's more the the psychology uh, of the message he didn't he it's more the communication issue that he had to deal with he was so, so his style exactly his style it really irked a lot of people <laughs> and on top of that because of the political opposition that he's also met uh he had to use some special articles or special section of the constitution that uh, made a what's called a blocked vote at the parliament, meaning that there's no real vote. It's a special it's a special mechanism that was put in place by De Gaulle back in fifty eight, at the time the constitution was drafted, because De Gaulle made it to his taste so that he was able to actually govern France, because he knew France is the country of opposition anyway. So he gave himself the tools to be able to govern the country. Okay, uh, I want to I want to move on to another issue that uh, President Macron has been involved in is uh, the uh, Ukraine uh, matter, uh, and and 
it, are the French citizens supportive of that? I mean, it, M Macron seems to be on the on the side of Ukraine and against the Russian invasion, and it is it, very strong, as, in, in my impression. Uh, and is that the, the is that the citizen of France? Are they all are they behind that? And I was also wondering if the history of France in World War II plays a role in this. It, it just seems possible to me, and I wonder if that comes up in discussions. Well, it's um, I I I my feeling is that France is definitely uh, behind Ukraine. Um, Russian is seen as the aggressor, uh, and Putin is seen as the big bully anyway. Um, it, it, regardless, I mean, no matter under what angle you look at it, he's the one who started it. He's the one who basically invaded Ukraine, right? right. Um, it, it's, it, there's, there's no other way to look at it. I only, I don't see any other way to look at it. I mean, I, I, I know some people are trying to make, to argue against that, but I, I don't see how it could work. Now, um, it, with regard to France and, and World War II, it probably has some impact, but what's very interesting to look at is the way the, uh, the countries of the old Eastern Bloc, Eastern Bloc reacted. If you, it, I mean, you know, if you look at Poland, if you look at the Baltic Republic, I mean, these people knew what Russia is because they had to support Russian rules for decades. So, I mean, they're so adamant about fighting Russia and helping Ukraine. I mean, not directly fighting Russia, but definitely helping Ukraine as much as they can because they know what it means. I mean, in terms of relative uh, assistance, the biggest uh, contributor to the Ukraine help is one of the Baltic Republic, one of the mm -hmm. tiniest countries. But in percentage of their wealth, they're providing a huge amount. I mean, well, these people quite suffered, suffered that, that, under Russia's rule. That, that's interesting because that kind of goes back to what you were talking about, perspective. They, they they have a different perspective uh, that that you also have, but they, can, they they see it through different eyes of the world, and they had personal experience of Russia, and the, the way that things uh, uh, oppress them. Is uh, as, as, as am I hearing that right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you, Poland has provided uh, fighter jets, you know, old MiGs that they had in the inventory, old tanks, whatever they could. Hmm. So the, the the message that I'm getting from all of our talk is is perspective is very important. Getting, you know, where <laughs> where you stand, where you what you see in your experience in life it, it is important on how you see the world and, and how right. you deal with it. Yeah. Now I I, I one of the I, I like a lot of things about France. One thing, the French national motto, and let's uh, put that up on the screen. I'd like you just to tell me, uh, you know, what the French national motto is, and what it means, and how did it come about? Liberté, égalité, fraternité. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Liberty, it, equality, it, fraternity. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's it's um, it's something that actually comes all the way back from the revolution, from the French Revolution in 1789. Um, it was not the motto of the Republic until 1848, which was the Second Republic in France. Um, but it's been around since the revolution. Um, the fraternity part is doesn't doesn't really raise a lot of issues, but. There is there is some discussions about which one of liberty or equal, equality you want to push, because uh, clearly there's some high antagonists. Um, if you if you have too much liberty, too much freedom, the equality might be damaged, and vice versa. 
if you try to have everybody equal, the liberty will be will suffer. So and and it's it's that's interesting because in in this motto, um, the 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 people leaning right are more for liberty. People leaning left are more for equality. And so it's still a subject of topic in in uh, and, and discussion in France. Is is that is that well, correct? We, the motto itself is accepted as one of the uh, symbols of the republic. Anyway, it's it's uh, nobody would even think of questioning the the motto, in as it is, right? But um, you have discussions in terms of when political parties argue or push their laws, push their propositions. You could see which one they try to promote more, and clearly. Liberty is on the right, equality is on the left. Ah, that's interesting. Okay, and 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 they still bring it up in discussions and just which yeah. the which one they press. Now, uh, are are there any other words of wisdom, uh, French words, French sayings that you can give us uh, because we're in a in the world, we're in a, a tough, tough time. Are there some words of wisdom in, from France that you could share with us? And and please translate them. <laughs> uh, in in French, I would no, I I I would not know of any French words like this. But uh, the French people, as as a society as a whole, they um they would like to slow things down. You know, take the time to live. That's mm -hmm. important. It's um, especially when you look at the U.S. When you somehow you you lose track of who you are, what what you're here for. You're not just here to make a buck. I mean, if it comes with it, that's fine, but it shouldn't be an end in itself. You so know, that's there are a, other things in life. That's a way to live, and again. Uh, it's another perspective, right? That's a French perspective, right? Exactly. And yeah. and and that's what gave Paris uh, the name, the, the city of light. I think is is just they the way that the the people lived there. They enjoyed life. Is that? Am I hearing that right? Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm well. Yeah, it is true that Paris has been a city of of life also because it's the city that had. A lot of uh, pleasures, a lot of occasions to enjoy life, whether it's artistic, cultural, um, but it's always been a a, a, a happy place. Um, maybe less nowadays because actually it doesn't have that much of that anymore. And 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 Paris is like all big cities, all capitals. It's fast. It's sometimes dirty. People are not necessarily nice, um, but but you could experience the same thing in any major major cities. New York City is is also known for this kind of things. Even though you could say the same thing about how New York City is is full of cultural event, artistic events. You could you could do all kinds of things in in New York City, but and and the same the same could be said of Paris, right? Um, it, it is still a pretty city. It is still definitely a city you sh anyone should want to visit because it is gorgeous. Um, but Paris is not France. You, I mean, especially Americans who don't necessarily know the world too well, uh, yeah. they should never forget that Paris is not represent does not represent all of France. Uh -huh. um, Okay, and 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 then and but but the but the general French perspective is, is that you've shared is is to slow down a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And go back to nature. Go back to nature. <laughs> That's probably why I love Hawaii too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I, I like that. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to close now. I want to thank you, and I want to close with the national anthem of france and the flag of france and what what it tell me what is the national anthem of france please la marseillaise, uh, la marseillaise. 
Le Marseillaise, okay? And we will play this as we go out. And I want to thank you, Freddie, well, for, for being my guest today. Aloha. And what, what do we say in France? You can say, uh, bonne journée, bonne soirée, it depends. It's, to me, it's bonne soirée because it's, uh, it's nighttime right now, but to you, it would be good. Bonne journée, which means have a good day. <laughs> have a good day, bonne journée. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.